So we are now live and we are sitting down with Ed Matt talking Fill or Kill, that trading show that we have done two, three, four installments of. And uh, this is uh, 29th of uh, January 2014. It's Fed Day and it's going to be a lot of talk on Fed and uh, how to trade. Um, how to trade the announcement. Uh, we're also going to be talking a little bit about a chart that I really like because I don't like it, uh, which is an extremely huge move. And uh, we're also going to be talking, uh, well, some fractals that uh, Ed likes to look at and um, the huge Turkish uh, rate hike. So uh, say uh, hello, Ed. Hi. Hi. Yeah. That's well, uh, great. Thanks for coming back. And <laughs> I've got a new name for the show, by the way. Not no. Phil or Kill. Kill. How about Do or Die? <laughs> <laughs> I really love Phil or Kill. <laughs> so, uh, no, we started now. It's about the right time, I think. 11 o'clock my time, 10 o'clock your time. I think it feels good. feels like a natural timing of it. So I'm, I'm finishing up the podcasting uh, setup. So most people will listen to this on their way home or whatever. So, and I realized that uh, we're trying to get the audio as good as possible because we realized that um, a large majority listens to this, not watches it. Because really it's just switching between me and, and Ed. So there's some charts, but you can always make it out. So uh, not to, I, I really want to, because we had some discussion before I turned on the recording and uh, I really want to share this chart here and I want to share, explain why I want to share this. So this is uh, a chart of, um, uh, which I think it's the Dow Jones actually <laughs> don't remember I think it's a no S&P 500 um, uh, overlaid with uh, I believe it's the Dow Jones from 1928 yeah. to 1930 so it's uh, this is a very uh, contested way of operating so I just want to I, I want to point pinpoint do some uh, do some um, Wait, I'm going to pull this chart up on a bigger screen so you can really see it. So this uh, is Norwegian writing on it, but the guy who wrote this, his name is Peter Warren. He's an uh, asset manager uh, out of Norway. And he's, um, I mean, just to preface this, because this is something you normally see from a place like Zero Hedge, so uh, where people possibly don't believe it so much. But this is coming from a guy who is uh, world class in uh, um, risk-adjusted returns. I, I've in the last two years his funds have outperformed almost everyone, in a bull market, and uh, I just find it fascinating that he told me that he kept this chart on his screen for quite a while, as a novelty. So he doesn't take this necessarily seriously, but it's a novelty. So this chart, uh, uh, it, it basically the yellow line now is matching so closely to the analog from 1928 to 19. Uh, like right before the crash, that it was worth noting. So he posted this now, and I thought it was quite brave to post something so easily to ridicule because uh, in a bull market, it's almost it almost feels like uh, it's um, it's a, it's such a sin to be to be bearish that uh, it's almost like prison time for it. So he's not being bearish here. He's not saying this is going to happen. But what he's saying is. Um, this is a this is a market where everyone and their mother is uh, bullish. Uh, that that people have such a uh, it's it's such a hard time to even think about using negative uh, signals uh, for analysis. So uh, in in a in a bear uh, in an early bull market, people will say, oh, it's RSI this or technical analysis that or or analog to the to the sixties or whatever, because. It's always great to have all these technical reasons for, for stocks, stocks to go up. But people generally in bull markets don't like things that, that paint a picture of anything that could go wrong. So uh, there are obvious reasons for, for things to, to potentially blow up in, um, in uh, Europe and the US in term and China as well. And, uh, you, but nobody's making this prediction. But it's a curious. It's curious to see how close they align. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna guess that um, uh, that the correlation is probably over ninety percent on this, and uh, meaning that it's it's a clearly a meaningful correlation. So 
uh, just to end my, I hear Ed this uh, huffing in the background here. <laughs> um, the, the reason why this is important is um, uh, it says something about human psychology and it says something about how people res respond to, uh, well, respond to uh, different events, even though it's different time zones. So it's kind of uh, what technical analysis, it's kind of what fractals are, it's all these uh, sciences that are built around uh, um, quantifying the market. <coughs> uh, a lot of these are taken seriously, but, but this is something where people don't even want to imagine that something can go wrong in the market. So with, with taper, with all these things, there's clearly a number of triggers and uh, gearing being very high. So that was kind of my preface and me and Ed had a little bit of a disagreement for a few days now about this chart. And well, not about the charts, very right? just about the uh, why we would cover it because um, it's been uh, it's been a subject of quite a big debate. CNBC covers the same chart. It was posted by DeMarc a while ago. And the first obvious thing is when you look at it is it, is that it was posted to and the suggestion made it was a top was too early they didn't match the price action which called for a massive further blowout to the upside which in fact in fairness now um, with the Christmas price action uh, we've seen so it's got a closer match to it um, the point I was making before is you can go back through history and you can use these these rallies because they're all very similar and you can place it wrongly and you can place it correctly and price action this is a danger about fractals and analogy is that um, it's always dangerous to use to start with your view and then try and work um, use a fractal any tool for that matter to justify your view. You need a clean chart, and I can match that chart much better with an earlier stage within the bull market within 1928. And I would cite PE ratios. I would cite, cite um, social evidence to suggest that we're not near that we're not actually at the top yet. Um, I can make that chart fit exactly to the tip, top tick now. Uh, what is interesting, the point I would, I mean, I, there's a lot of evidence I can use to show why it is a top and why it isn't a top. And why I, after, you know, sit there because I'm, you know, I'm happy if it's a top because I'm, I can sell. Um, uh, and I'm happy it's got further to go because I, I, can, well, I have no axe to grind on this. Uh, I just want to be the right, right way. But what I do need to do is, is to approach it from an unbiased point of view. And the reason I, I didn't want to go into it today is, quite frankly, there's a lot of evidence. Uh, you know, I can talk or show the evidence over probably a two-hour period as to why. I think this is, uh, it's not yet at the top. But it doesn't mean this is the problem. Is, and so many people extrapolate from one thing and then take it too far. The fact the Dow's come off, yeah, it must be 1929. The yeah. fact it could go, let's say it goes 10% lower or 5% lower, which I don't think it will, um, then it's 1929. Well, within any bull market, let's say it was in 1927 and it's got another 20, 30% to the upside. Then well, that's a piece of evidence. In, back in the 20s, it multiplied by three times. The index multiplied by three times. It hasn't done that. That's 21,000 Dow. That's the first point. I mean, I'm not going to go off in there. But you've got to stick with the, you know, you stop with, I was talked about using fractals and using the right criteria and sticking with those criteria and following it through. So, yes, there will be corrections in any bull market. There will be aggressive corrections, probably very, very aggressive. And uh, as a consequence, you know, I mean, it's picking up on Tyler's point yesterday. Uh, hang on, I've got something going on. Those corrections <laughs> are healthy, healthy not just to, yeah, to the stability but also to the upturn. But so we haven't had the correction. Doesn't you know, that... let me let me. So I'm now, sorry. now I've slapped your wrists. Yeah. Let me actually uh, agree with the point. Is it's a reflection of um, of sentiment that uh, it's very rare to find so many people looking for a top at a top. Now you're saying the world is universally bullish. I've seen that chart banded around for months now. Uh, as I said, CNBC covered it, um, and lo and behold, the market's five, whatever, 10% higher uh, as, not, oh yeah, almost as a consequence. It is a reflection that, you know, when people start, when the biggest indicator, actually Howard said this the other day, it was a really shrewd observation. The best indicator is no indicator. When people stop talking about a potential top, when they realize that they just have to be long, regardless, because they can't do on a miss out in the move, that is more likely to be a top than when people are talking about the previous major correction. 
you know, I, well, I'm not going to go. I said I'm not going to go down there um, without you know using all the fire power I have to explain why I don't actually think it is 1929 yet. Um, but it's it's all these things, uh, all these triggers are, are useful to see how people react. One thing does happen. Talking about getting grumpy about things, is I've yeah, you are grumpy now. today. No, no, I know. No, I'm getting grumpy. Um, <laughs> I'm a little grumpy well, too. I'm not really. Um, you know, I just said I don't want to go down the, the route of comparing 1929 because I, you know, I don't think um, on a day like FOMC when people shouldn't be committing necessarily aggressively medium term, uh, then it's. Po I don't want to encourage people to do that on the back of uh, um, without proper evidence either way. Um, but one thing is, it's useful, is to see how people react. Now, since I've been on Twitter, again, you know, people say, why are you on Twitter? You know, you're a professional trader, you do all these things, clearly a, a busy guy. You, um, then why do you do it? One thing is I find the reaction, not just to what I'm seeing out there, to reactions to prices, but also reactions to comments. The number of times, um, would you believe it, some people are occasionally rude on Twitter. You know, mm, unfortunately, so. the internet is unaccountable. I the number of times that. that people, I tell you, I would say at least, maybe I invoke people to be rude, but uh, at least 75% of the time when people are rude, it's at a top or a bottom. And uh, they're that committed, convinced, blinkered, they actually don't like it. When someone like uh, me, who has a habit of, um, fading moves comes out and tells them that it's going to turn. I remember the amount of grief I got when um, I was bullish on Euro Swiss as it was collapsing. Uh, just it was not even a fair, it was beyond offensive. And the same thing, people don't, and this is your point, which is quite interesting. It's worthwhile putting a chart out like that just to see how people react. Yeah. One thing I noticed, um, there are a lot of bears out there. And a lot of bears jumped on the, I call it the DeMarc chart. Uh, chart because he was a guy, well, first probably got it into the public domain most uh, most obviously through CNBC. A lot of people jumped on it, uh, which is probably why it's as I said it's now five to ten percent higher. The problem also I have with that, and the reason why I wanted to, particularly to counter it is because I've seen too often, uh, and um, people will know where I'm coming from with Elliott Wave. Uh, I've seen too many major proponents, very public proponents of a certain technique, getting it wrong. And then that devalues the technique, which is totally false. Totally false. Um, just because someone gets it wrong doesn't mean their approach they're using is wrong. It may be wrong in that instance, but uh, in future, in a different market, it may be absolutely the right technique. My worry but, but can is I, that... Can I, uh, I mean, I, I wanted to let you finish your argument because I, I think you're kind of misreading. I, so I, I remember now how this came about. So the first time I ever saw this chart was you shared it. And... Uh, the first time I got interested in this chart was uh, the reaction to your sharing where it was universally mocked and uh, people it's very easy to to mock something like this because it looks like a dark art nobody thinks about what it actually means or, or any deeper sensations but uh, about a day or two later I was uh, I, I was made aware that uh, uh, other people had made the same connection and these, uh, like like the guy uh, Peter Warren, who's uh, who's such a, like a deep thinker, uh, he he uh, he had this chart already up before anyone, so completely uh, not not connected to to this uh, to this uh, th this was what was going on on Twitter, and the reaction uh, people were spewing once you try to even make yeah. the point that this could be is it, is so remarkable. And that was my data point. The, the yeah, chart in itself is, is like, yeah, it's one I, in a million. I, but the reaction I, to the I, chart is what worries me. And you see reaction and you see these people who are, there's a lot of people who are very smart and very confident in their intelligence. And you see that they're, they're just like berating you for, for even suggesting that something could be wrong. And, and that's, a, that's a worrying sign. So uh, like you said, like okay, you... Well, let's, let's take it, right? Let, we, we kind of cover that. Let's take it one step further, because I agree. And I, I wanted to finish on with agreeing with the point is it's, um, uh, you know, it's interesting to put things out there as a devil's advocate almost to see how people react. Uh, so I, I believe I use sentiment a lot. Um, and, and so I need a good gauge of sentiment. Unfortunately, despite so, what some people say, using sentiment is, is not so straightforward because sentiment doesn't always translate into positions. 
And what we're really interested in is not only the positions in the market, but also the potential for new positions, the capacity of the market, the real flows, not just what the flows are now, but what they could be. So it's useful to get a gauge of sentiment to get a better read of what will likely happen. So when you put things out like that and people slap your wrists, you know, they may be uh, bullish, but they may actually be thinking it's a bit toppish here. I'm looking to buy lower down, in fact, not be long. They may be selling, which I suspect a lot of people did on the, you know, go back to that when, you know, about the idea it's 1928, 1929 rather. Um, they may actually have um, sold into it. And uh, as a result, they're blown out through the Christmas period because it's too big a move. It's, you've got to use things, sentiment, indicators of sentiments like that to get a better read of what might happen. Um, but it's, it's um, and it's like, you're quite right. It's, uh, because something doesn't perform necessarily well today, it doesn't mean it's going to not perform well tomorrow. So whether you believe that, that it's a close proximity to 1929 now, now, or if you believe, like me, that we've got to go completely bananas, stupid, irrational exuberance, um, green spends, low on C, comment. It back in was it 95 or whatever um that when we've got to take it too far then that's going to be uh, you know it's a, it's a different debate it's the debate i wanted to have but, but let's uh, uh, so i just wanted to to put that out there i know you didn't but i did anyway and let's just uh, leave it at that at this time and i just want to um, uh, move on to much more pressing things is fomc uh so give me your right what, what, what do you think the background is on FOMC. So let's I mean, just do the basic stuff. Uh, Goldman had a note out which was incredibly deflated yesterday. I remember the, in the good old taper days where they made all these like elaborate ways of phrasing. So uh, what's done now is that the, the, the $200 million tanker has started to turn. That takes a very long time to turn. So it's not done at 180 yet, but they started to shift off. So the tanker now is clearly, there, there has to be phenomenal things to happen if, uh, if uh, the Fed will, will stop anything they've been doing. So uh, Goldman predicts uh, another 10 million, uh, another 10 billion uh, taper off of the um, asset purchases and uh, basically no real action. So there, Ed just left, I don't know why. <laughs> so the coffee carry on, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is it's brilliant, it's beautifully, uh, beautifully produced, this show. And um, so uh, that's what Goldman thinks. Very boring, very predictable. Uh, last, uh, the, the last meeting for, um, for Bernanke. And I think they're absolutely right, because I think what a lot of these uh, economists, they're always trying to, to, to brush up some kind of action. And... Um, in terms of it's difficult. It's good, really difficult. Don't get me on a, on a car misc, uh, being one. Um, uh, they have a place. Um, the yeah, problem they're, they're is they're marketing don't... guys. I mean, and what's they interesting is they're place. not even trying now. So uh, it would be uh, it would be quite surprising if they didn't taper more. But it's not. I, I don't think the Fed will have any big effect now because well, they already. Talk, let's say you said let's take it back to basics. Let's take it one step further back. Is most people come in the market? Well, let's be honest. Um, as a sweeping statement, but a lot of people come into the market believing markets are driven by fundamentals, which uh, I would argue in the long term ultimately they are, but from the people believe that they are at all times and immediately uh, driven by fundamentals. And so they will look to try and work out, you know, with earnings release, you know, they'll try and work out how the market will move, uh, economic releases, etc., and even on Fed policy, that it will have a proportional and direct effect on the price. Um, the problem is, obviously, then you go one step further, is you then is what people are expecting. And it then comes a question of what are they expecting going into FM and C last time or, or this time? And then it what's, comes what's one FMMC? step further. Let me, let me finish because this is. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's not just a question of uh, expectations. What it really comes down to is the expectations of expectations and therefore the positions currently and the likely positions in response to any given outcome. So immediately I've taken it from a, a straightforward one arrow to about four or five, five or six to ten possible combinations. You know, the world is black and white, goes up and down. So what happens? Take the last FOMC. 
The world and his wife was of the opinion that when the Fed ended quantitative easing, that would be the, the trigger, if you like, for a stock market fall, but certainly for a bond market uh, retrenchment. You know, that yields would be uh, they're no longer going low, that we're going to see a major bear market in, in notes and, and bonds. And what's the response? The response is uh, amazingly, in my opinion, certainly in, in SMPs and the Dow, was as soon as they announced taper, whack, up it goes. Because the world is not black and white, it's not two dimensional. I remember actually tweeting, I was trying to be clever as usual with my poor sense of humor. One or two people have commented on that today. <laughs> Uh, I was talking about uh, the last FOMC being likely to be, because I was using this fractal, uh, was likely to be 50 shades of grey. In other words, it's not black and white. So and, and lo and uh, behold, we've got a, shades of grey with the announcing taper. <laughs> and the net consequence was, was well, the market rally. Why did it rally? Well, because you could argue people were all short expecting taper. They weren't expecting taper. Um, I would, certainly wasn't expecting. I don't think the consensus was for taper. Consensus going to December last time was pretty much nothing. They're not going to do anything until probably February, I think, was probably the large view. And now, now that they've done it, it's very difficult going to Benan Benanke's last last ditch stand. Um, they're going to do anything different. I mean, I, I I think you've got a long way to go to find them. Anyone saying it's going to be any different to 10 billion more the same? And you as, as you said, um, the the, the whatever 10, 10 ton steamer that Goldman is um, or the market is, it's going to have too much of a different view. So what it comes down to then is what are the positions going into this on, you know, on one's interpretation? Well, the market will take the view that they're going to repeat uh, taper 10 billion. And therefore, they will initially take the view that therefore the stock markets will come off um, and therefore... Uh, the bond market will, will suffer a consequence. And they'll step back and say, well, that's what I thought last time. Uh, so therefore, given that the market um, is likely to um, uh, you know, take the same view, then I'll, I'm going to second guess this. And I think maybe everyone else is short into, the mar into this, thinking the same thing, and then it will rally. So I'll be long. Um, and you know, net consequence, in my view, is that we'll wipe out the... Um, some people will be buying on, on the rally, the last 24 hours or so on the back of Turkey and they'll get wiped out probably on an initial reaction to the FOMC using the fractal again, uh, but it will ultimately end up higher. Um, so it's not so forward, so straightforward. Is this chart you're referring to now? I mean, you have yeah, this. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Do you see the uh, white arrow? That's basically what I'm saying. And I, I, you know, I postulate, I should have put a question mark after the second one because I don't know they're going to come out with 10 billion taper, but if price action's the same, then we should go to 160.50. Well, we from the low, the last time uh, before taper, 24 hours before taper, it rallied. It rallied, the Dow rallied 270 points from a new low. Yesterday, it rallied 270 points from a new low to 160.50. So it should fade. You know, it's kind of an obvious play. It should fade, should trade the range today into FMC. Now, if it follows the same price action, it will spike down to 159.20 and then ramp. Now, let, let's say I'm wrong, you know, um, then I'm wrong. Uh, but, but what but I, I do, have, know, I have evidence supporting what you're saying now. Actually, yeah, I know, I know. You, you commented, you said uh, something similar. Um, but the great thing about, let me finish this part, and then you you can wax lyrical. Um, is that if it starts to do what I'm outlining here, then I have a map. You know, if it starts to ramp that hunt, that like that, then I know that it's it's carry on the same analogy, the same fractal. Um, but carry on. No, I, I want to. No, I'm sorry for interrupting. I just wanted to say that. Uh, running our uh, or my favorite new tool. It's kind of an interesting thing because it's this is the uh, previous FOMCs at this RSI level. Basically, markets are oversold, or not oversold, but they're at least more sold than bought. And uh, this um, this chart here, it's a little bit bigger there. Uh, it shows four patterns that are likely to occur based on previous situations this is a sample size of uh, I, I don't have I think it's like 10 or something like to this effect and uh, so it's a, it's a decent amount but it's just it's a different approach to what you're saying it's if it if it breaks out it will probably be uh, an okay move is that a fair assessment uh, okay bullish move. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um. 
Okay, what's an okay, sorry? Um, what's an okay bullish move? I mean, something you can jump on. I'm not a great jumper. I'm, I'm, well, actually, this is an interesting point because actually, what I wanted to do today was talk about how you trade events like this because I'm not a great believer. You know, being a technician, if you like, I'm not a great believer in trying to calculate the fundamentals because I've been wrong too often trying to work out what they likely to do. And you know, last time I would have got it totally wrong in every way, which way but lose, well, and lose. Um, but so I, I tend to rely on, on on price action, but it's more about how you you manage that risk, because um, I, I I think there's very conflicting evidence. So a lot of algos out there, a lot of people who try and predict what they're going to do and therefore position accordingly. Uh, the great thing about last time was you didn't have, need any position into FMC, um, and even in fact, if you reacted in like the obvious way after FMC, you would have got buried, and if you did the the counterintuitive thing. Then you would have probably made serious money. Which picks up the point about um, expecting the unexpected and discounting the obvious, which I think is a badly rephrased version of a George Soros quote. Um, but how do you, you trade it? Because there's on the one hand, I mean, I, people will know that I, I uh, you know, I'm, I never try and stop learning. So I often reading what other, you know, what not other great traders, but what great traders have said and done, and you know, maybe there are lessons to be learnt. I always go back through what I've done to try and learn or relearn lessons. And on the one hand, you've got someone like uh, Jesse Livermore, who said um, that in order to be, you know, to be a true speculator, you need to anticipate. Only the only people people who react are gamblers, which I find slightly counterintuitive. But that was the point he made. And yet, you've got someone like Paul Tudor Jones, made famous by that 1987. Crash trade, and which was also you know, another an analog actually of 1929, uh, but he he made became notorious because of that, partly because of the documentary made. But he actually said that he didn't, and I'm not convinced this is the truth, that he didn't take positions into figures because he thought that was too much like gambling because he had no idea what the reaction would be. You know, I, I think probably. He was being a bit liberal with his interpretation of how he traded. I think he did take positions into to events, but based not necessarily on his reading of the likely outcome or the likely actual outcome, the details of what people said or what the releases were, but more about the positions reacting to uh, the outcome, if you like. So, you know, you've got two people there saying two very different things. Uh, and I think what it, you know, there's a picture of Jesse Livermore. Um, and how do you take that? And I think the answer is you have to be true to your approach. If you are someone who is trading, you know, scalping on the day, do you really want to punt, go into the numbers, uh, on, you know, based on your interpretation if, you, if you're scalping because your risk return is likely to be potentially risk likely to be skewed. If you don't trade fundamentals, do you really want to go into the position on, on a fundamental play? Um, are you basing it on, like me, if you're basing it on something else, then you know, it doesn't matter really what, uh, what they say because it should react in a certain way. I would you know, qualify that as I did yesterday or the day before. You know, I rely on my charts, but I also rely on I mean, This is a risk business. If I'm going to be around here tomorrow. I need to manage first and foremost, uh, manage my risk. So if I think there, there's a potential the risk return is against me or skewed against me potentially, then I'm not going to take the, the level of risk. Um, and that's Paul Tudor Jones there. I think, in fact, that's the one, that's, wasn't that the famous interview um, for his comments about women traders? No, it's not the one, yeah. That it's was, not that uh, one. Panel debate, yeah. That's amazing. But he's right, by the way. I don't want to go back. I mean, he, he's making a beautiful point, but people just completely got that wrong. <laughs> about women? Yeah, and he didn't say about women. So his point was a completely different one than one picked yeah. up, if you actually listen to it. So I, was the, I, I did go sort of, I don't know, on record or whatever you want to call it, and say that he's right. I mean, if you're emotionally unstable, you shouldn't trade. And he just said that when, you're, uh, when you have a newborn kid, you, you shouldn't be e trading. If you're, and he also said if you're in a divorce, male or female, he takes away all their AUM. Because that's not well, the state you want to be in. Well, I, I would put it differently because I, I think that's bordering on patronizing. Um, I don't mean to be nasty about that, but it's not, you know, if 
if you're going through, I, I've actually said this myself, you know, there are times I found myself trading really badly through good events, you know, the birth of a child or, or, or some good news and some bad news and whatever you tend to, you know, if you are driven by emotions, then you, you're going to find it difficult because it's difficult to maintain the balance and perspective. But one thing I would do is, is always be aware of your own emotional state. Always be aware of yourself. The, the person's psyche or what you're doing is an important part of any trade because you have to anticipate how you're likely to react to certain events. And if you haven't actually taken that into account, then you might find yourself doing something completely different to what you first intended. So, you know, the case of, you know, women going through childbirth and, and trading, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that they shouldn't trade because I don't think that's, you know, I think there are many women who would probably be well, to be even better traders as a consequence. But I would say, you know, be aware of what you're going through and therefore how that might affect you and, and take that into account. And if you think it might affect you adversely, then don't trade. If you think you can handle it um, and you're aware of the issues, I mean, being aware of problems is always halfway to the solution, isn't it? Then that's fine. But I wouldn't, you know, I, 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 I'm the type of person who, who probably would venture an opinion if I thought something was, you know, in danger of uh, doing themselves some, some harm. But, um, you know, I think it's up to people to make their own decisions and learn themselves, and, but hopefully uh, follow some good examples. But, but I think you're, you're misreading me. I'm not saying women shouldn't trade, uh, pregnant women shouldn't trade. I'm saying that uh, emotions do affect people quite a bit, and uh, in the same way as if you're if somebody's driving, when uh, when you're breastfeeding, it could it could be dangerous because you have you're you're drained with energy. So, it, but because trading is like this like super uh, this extreme situation to be in as a human being. So, uh, in order to perform, you have to be aware of who you are and. And uh, uh, again, going back to the previously mentioned Peter Warren, he said uh, almost no one is born a trader. Uh, it's always uh, a trained skill. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I think you can, you know, I think you can have an aptitude for certain things that leans you towards the ability to do certain things well. But I don't think, I think trading is not a, is not a natural. Uh, aptitude not to do it well because not to understand risk and to manage risk i don't think that's necessary because we all get overexcited it's human to get overexcited you know and start piling hey this is the great the best thing i've ever done you know and going overboard next thing you know you burn your account i think that's human so i think you've got to train that out of you i think a lot of um, successful traders have have almost gone against human instinct and, and trained it out of themselves because to the extent that, you know, I've made this point before, that analysis, I think you can be passionate about analysis and get really excited about markets and what they're doing. But when it comes to trading, talking about the execution of that analysis, I think being dispassionate, being disciplined, being quite cold is a much better, you know, is a much better approach. And I think if to the extent that people may find themselves in circumstances where they can't execute coldly uh, and in an impartial, unbiased way, um, and you know they need to think what they're they're doing. Um, but yesterday I mean, we talked to Carl Richards. Did you see that interview? No. No. Yesterday, last night, at least my time. Uh, he's a wealth manager. Uh, brilliant guy. He does these like art artworks. To I'm going to show you afterwards. It's uh, uh, he goes under the handle Behavior Gap, and. Uh, yeah. And he, he's just he's just a brilliant guy, and his approach is so pure, and I really like that. But what's interesting is, like, almost, I didn't even think about what I was asking. And I, I he talked about mistakes, and people are, are very bad with money. And I said, what, what was your biggest mistake? And he told a story, and it was like, it was almost physically hard to listen to it, because you can see him, uh, and he was very honest about it, like when he bought a house in Las Vegas in 2007, and what happened and what it was like emotionally to go through that, and how he, being a trained money manager, making beautiful decisions for other people, and at the same time not being able to not make a bad decision himself, and how it felt like when that, that uh, house doubled in value in less than a year, I think it was 2006, 2007, and like dealing with that sort of unnatural sensation and then dealing with the fact that it, it crashed in value and uh, it's um, 
it's just it's, uh, it, it's fantastic to listen to that kind of honesty i don't want to ask yeah, you no. your biggest mistake like in trading but uh it's i think making mistakes is such a big part of it and understanding how important mistakes are yeah i'll be um, my biggest mistakes have stemmed from um, emotion attached to um to bad decisions or bad trades in other words um things like um uh, refusal to believe that I'm wrong, uh, refusal to uh, to you know to get out of the position when it's got through my stop, things like that. Things that um, you know, I was telling someone the other day that it wasn't you know, going back a few years. I, I was carrying some pretty significant risk and went on um, holiday for two weeks uh, with a significant risk. I was well in the money. Um, in fact, this didn't turn out badly at all. I went on a skiing holiday for two weeks. Um, with a euro yen position, and um, I was up probably like eight percent. Two weeks came back, and it was still eight percent. But Jesus what am I playing at? You know, where's the risk management there? So there's lessons I learned in, in the whole process of trading. Why, why did you do that? Sorry, why? Why did you? Why did you keep that trade on? Because I, I had a, a belief in the medium term that it was going higher. But did you have stops? That, that it could go back down three or four percent. I wouldn't necessarily know that it's going to do that, so I wouldn't want to cut the position. Um, but in fact, because I was a believer, it's going to go much higher um, that I was going to run it. And that's what I did. And I um, can't remember how it played out, but I just remember now looking back how anyone could ever manage risk that way. But that's the lesson I learned. Uh, thankfully, in that instance, um, you, know, um, you know, I learned a lesson without uh, too painfully. But other lessons you've learned, you know, you learn typically through through pain when things go wrong. Often, most of my lessons learned are about the nature of the, some of the institutions I've dealt with, yeah, you know, and um, and how that world has changed as well for the better. I think. I, I think that's actually a good point you're bringing out because there's so many there's so many dodgy actors in finance, and uh, in the past year when I've been sort of uh, uh, working as a consultant mostly and dealing with a lot of people, I think dealing with the wrong kind of people is your biggest risk. And especially uh, the broker types and and these uh, like very sort of uh, rough well, around the edges salesmen. I, I'd be uh, dangerous for casting aspersions on a, on a group of people. No, but, no, no. Uh, in any, I said a type. Um, there will be some bad eggs on around or people or people who don't. It doesn't everyone go that far. Who have a different perspective to you? You know, you don't necessarily see where they're they're coming from. But let's let's. No, but it's sure. interesting. I, I just think that that kind of mistakes is if you learn from a mistake like that. You you benefit so much. Yeah, I mean, look, if I you think. look at all the great traders, um, they've all been had a habit of going through what, what they've done wrong, and learned the lessons accordingly, um, and come out the other side. And uh, you know, that's you know, I always want to help people find shortcuts to to learning how to trade because you know, experience you know the way you learn best is by losing money. So you don't want to actively go out there and lose money so that you learn, but it is the best way to, to learn. Um, but if you can find shortcuts by you know, reading about other people, watching other people, or people talking about how they've gone through certain, avoided certain pitfalls, um, or can avoid certain pitfalls now, having gone through that, then that all, that all helps. But it's important to keep the um, perspective, but also keeping one's perspective of the perspective as well. You know, it's kind of... It's always so easy in black and white in textbooks. It's always so easy. And um, going back actually to where we were talking about how you trade fundamentals, how you trade is being true to your system and not adjusting your system because you know you get carried away one way or the other by what you think the Fed's going to do or otherwise. If that's how you trade and that's percentage wise through having gone through the records where you've made money and lost money, that's how you make money, then stick to it. And if, if you find that the times you've lost money is when you got overexcited going off from one and because, you know, someone's told you something or whatever, then don't do it, you know. It's just um, – and how you how I can justify what Jesse Livermore said, that people, you know, reacting are, are gamblers rather than people anticipating are true traders. And something like Paul Tudor Jones saying he didn't um, take a punt going into figures. How you reconcile them, quite simply, is that's how they trade. Uh, Jesse Livermore, I mean, both have had records of ups and downs, but were arguably great traders because they pursued, over the long term, they pursued their systems with a huge amount of discipline and understanding. Um, so, you know, you know, for me to pick up, I follow a guy who's really good with, say, uh, MACD or RSIs or stochastics, which I don't tend to use, and, and then, uh, to use that in my system suddenly, 
is going to be dangerous. Uh, for someone, for a quant guy to start, you know, uh, using uh, some non-quantitative approach is, is equally is equally dangerous. If if that is um, you, you know, your track record and what you do well, and what you found to work is based on on a certain approach. Don't you know, don't mend it if it's not broke. Um, so you know, if on the basis of what I do, I'm going to be um, I'm long uh, stocks as people well know um, now. Hence my green hat um, and things like dollar. Can you hold it closer to the camera? Of risk, and, but I'm looking to, to add to on a, a little set off on FOMC. Yeah, so you're you're fairly bullish now. I haven't changed. Um, you know, basically since uh, the breakdown, we were saying the Dow going through sixteen thousand. I've started buying. I'm still buying, uh, been buying, and I'm still looking to add on a dips. Anyway, we haven't talked about no, I, what I, is. But I don't want to. I don't want to end the right because you you said like how how would you trade around FOMC? Do you just keep a position you like and? Well, that's the point I was trying to make. Without going through every possible trading strategy one can have into FOMC, you've got to keep to your technique and what you use. And if you don't have a technique that can suitably handle the risk return, the risk elements of FOMC, then don't have a position. You know, if it's sitting on a trend line, let's say, and you trade trend lines, then you know, as long as you've set the risk return and it's and it, rights then you know maybe you you buy into the basis of the trend line i think the point i made earlier is, is that the last fomc was gray it's not so straightforward or black and white and i don't think there's any difference in this one um what is still there are, you know i drew the analogy between the dow and the s p and the last fomc and then just just do what i mean this is what i do is then i say well if that's the case what are the markets what do they do around fomc and i can i can name i won't name um, four or five other markets are doing exactly the same thing, which is going to be interesting uh, because it gives me a game plan to act. Um, well, I'm already positioned one way, but also to add to those positions. But anyway, the um, one thing, I, let me ask you a question or ask anyone out there a question is, <clears throat> is the Fed going to pay any attention at all to Turkey? That's an interesting one. I would say that it's probably more important than you think, based on Turkey being an analog. Again, it's analogs, <laughs> being an analog for uh, East meets West in a way, because uh, I mean Istanbul is in a way where Europe and Asia meets. So stability in in Turkey is, uh, I think, more important than than is necessarily obvious now to the stability in the Middle East, but. Uh, the Fed? That's a very good question, actually. Uh, it's a good question, but I think the answer is quite dull, really. Um, I think they'll ask the question. I think they yeah, they wouldn't be doing due diligence, uh, be careless if they didn't take into into a, into account. You know, because are we going to do something that could rock the likes of Turkey and therefore rock the world and come back? I don't think they care. Horses. Do you think they care about that? Well, of course they can. The Fed's very mindful, not just from a selfish point of view. I mean, the world is, is a small place, is that if something happens, if the Fed does something, and as a consequence has um, impacts elsewhere, then it will come back to haunt the Fed one way or the other, and they may have to undo what they've done because they were rash or, or whatever. So they have to take these factors into account. Um, but I think. But what do you think about the Turkish, uh, the Turkish situation? I mean, it's... Quite a yeah, well, that's my point. Let me just quickly finish my point. Is I, I don't think it's going to anything that um, I don't think anything the Fed does is going to impact Turkey unduly, and therefore you know they're free to do what they they would do. And in fact, it'd be a dangerous signal um, if they actually did something. If you imagine what they're saying, we think basically they're saying we've not tapered because we think the situation in Turkey. I mean, they wouldn't say it like this, but they might. It might be the implication of how some people might take it. We won't do anything because the situation in Turkey is so dire that if we did something, it would be even more serious. I mean, that, that would be the end of Turkey, you know? So they're not going to do anything like that. So I think, um, to cut a long story short, round about the houses, you come back to the same point, it's going to have, uh, has little bearing on what the FOMC does. And what has it, does it have, does Turkey have a bearing on what the other markets are doing? I think it does. Um, it's another factor in the, um, another coal in the fire, if you like. But that's kind of um, 
Were you surprised by the rate yeah, increase I was, in Turkey? I was surprised by I was surprised by the move. I mean, this reminds me. Yes, yes, yes. I, I keep bringing up uh, I keep bringing up the run on the pound and the interest rate mechanism, and it, it just reminds me of that because uh, what was so interesting uh, in uh, in the bad old days uh, when George Soros was uh, running against uh, the pound is uh, the central bank truly didn't understand what their their purpose was. So the purpose is to provide stability. I mean, you lived, you were, uh, were you trading at that point? In 1992? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was involved. Yeah. Okay. I was <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, at that time, uh, it seemed that uh, the central bank, the English central bank, or Bank of England, uh, they didn't understand how important it was to provide stability. No, 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 no. That's a, that's an unfair comment. Do you think so? Um, yeah, no, no. I, the Bank of England were, were customers of mine at, at the time. Okay. Very and then interesting. you know more of this than me. But I'm just saying the market perception yeah, yeah, no, no, but, of it. No, but the, um, you know, it's, it's not so clear. I don't want to relive 1992. But let's not talk I about it if it's sensitive. I think the circumstances are quite, quite different. But the, the similar analogy, I tell you where the analogy, why you immediately think of 1992, because the interest rate hike, the levels are, are quite similar. Yeah. And the fact that there was questions about undoing certain things was, again, you know, Norman Lamont undid the 2 in, the further 2% increase that, that buried manufacturing in the UK. And, you know, it's buried politically, it's had a big impact since as well. Um, but you know the consequences of the f what that allowed happened by coming out of the ERM that by refusing to put up interest rates any by realizing their position in the ERM was untenable by coming out led to a collapse in sterling and, and confidence confidence not just in sterling but in the economic management of the country at the time and in the Tory party and and many other things besides um, that's quite different I think to what we've seen in it's in in Turkey Italy. You know, crises have started by people misspeaking like that. Um, but um, in Turkey, it's, it's quite different because I think this is actually, um, this is creating stability. Do you think so, really? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think Such they're basically what they're saying move, is we're yeah. willing to act. They're not, they're not trying to, there's no artifice involved. The, the, Sterling in the ERM should never have been there. That was a big mistake, monetary-wise, um, exchange rate wise everything else I mean Turkey's floating and falling out of bed the lira's been falling out of bed and what they've done is come in and whack people around the slap their wrists and saying you know you're gonna play this thing you're gonna you gonna pay the price um, and I think that's the point I made I didn't expect I expected one more dip to 820 not as the scale of that move but I think the point still is valid you know, that this is just killed the market for a while you know, I think the, the debate's out as to whether it's topped or not. There's this chart I sent you actually about um, uh, similar price action to, to gold because I think the Turkish lira is a bubble situation um, and a bubble that, that will be pricked and deflated. And the question is whether it's popped, um, whether the last couple of days have seen it pop or not. If you go down, can you show that chart, uh, Drew, the analogy with gold? Yes. Is this uh, the one? Yeah, yeah. Right. I can full screen typical that. A it's a typical, again, it's typical bubble price action. Um, I don't know. Have you got anything that highlights something? Can you highlight a previous? Uh, not right now. I mean, I can do it, but yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. No, I just wanted to point out. It's, uh, it might not be the top. But either way, if you look at it saying it's, actually, it's more aggressive than the previous consolidation, if it's not going to do this, then it's... Uh, you know, it's not going to turn around, then it will still consolidate before going higher because that's what it's done in the previous reactions like this. But that's a possible template. Most of the templates out there in terms of aggressive trends are following similar patterns. So there is an analogy with uh, between gold and the bubble bursting in gold and, say, the Turkish lira and some other emerging markets. Um, but it looks to me like what we've seen is on the back of the hike, you've seen a gap down and we've just filled the gap. That's for me is the first sign of a, of a dull market, a stable market that's saying the move is not sustainable because we've just completely unwound it. We filled the gap. So I would expect, in fact, probably this is looking a bit topish. We may well retest the lows in the next couple of days and then start rallying again. But, you know, the action is out of Turkey just as the action, I think, is out, out of gold. Um, well, let's look for the next bubble. Um, you know, it's debatable as to which bubble, what is going to be the next 
Next bubble. See, I'm utilizing the interview technique I'm, I talked about yesterday. I'm the problem is I can probably be out silent more than you can. So if you didn't watch yesterday, if you're just silent long enough, Ed will say something stupid <laughs> or something very, very honest. <laughs> no, you don't, you don't need to be silent for me to say something stupid. Um, but I, I was talking about being stupid. I have a very um, schoolboy sense of humor, I think. That's one way of describing it. Um, but I, I, cracked, I cracked a really good joke, I thought, yesterday. And no one really picked up. And my timing was wrong. I, I, I tweeted it just as durable ca goods came out. But I was talking about <laughs> robots and how, um, and how people, uh, you know, you, you used to go down the pub after a trading day and, and now you can't get in because there's so many trading robots there drinking algo pops. I mean, I, I thought it was funny. <laughs> it's, a lo it's, a lo it's a long walk, isn't it? Yeah, no, it's definitely a, uh, a long walk. <laughs> you need, you need, you need, um, you need uh, to go back to Paul Tudor Jones saying that trading was, uh, was a, an extreme form of living. Uh, there's nowhere else that I know that you can get such a buzz uh, through an intellectual discipline. Uh, that is, uh, you cannot pursue the intellectual discipline exclusively, in my opinion, without being more real. In other words, combining human sentiments and how people really are with some intellectual thoughts. And getting a buzz at the same time. You can't. I don't think you can find that many places elsewhere. Um, so you need, you know, when you've got those stresses and strains, you need things that can alleviate the stresses and strains. And for me, it's humour. I love a good laugh. Uh, um, you know, some would argue that my idea of humour is not a good laugh, but <laughs> but you've got to keep yourself sane. You know, I um, I remember when I started off trading. One thing I used to do quite often is I was, you know, I was working in banks. Um, I smoked at the time, um, and I used to go out. I took a position, and you know, it was a bad moment. I would go out and have a cigarette and, and walk away, have my stop in place and walk away because I didn't want to go through the initial stress and strains. And after a while, you learn to lose. You learn to take it. You don't need a fag or a cigarette to get through situations like that. Um, another way of doing it is, is to joke. Another way is to be on Twitter. Another way is to appear on um, things like big TV. Yeah. And, and, you know, not just because you, know, you think you might have something to share, but learn. I, I think you know, through all these things, you should never try and stop learning. But I think that's it's, interesting about this, uh, about this, uh, what we've done in the last like couple of months together. I mean, I got to know you almost by accident, really, when we started used to do, uh, doing Stocks and Scotch. And it just worked. Like I liked the chemistry, and I liked the uh, like I liked you as a person. And it's just interesting how much I've learned. And I thought I knew everything, like like many people tend to do. And I think that the one thing that's uh, similar to the people that I try to uh, spend my time with uh, is that people who are humble enough to think that they don't know everything or they don't know that much, really, even though they might do know a lot. <laughs> So. It's interesting because uh, what you're talking about, and I keep finding this, you know, when I'm on, when I've been talking to you, I've said it two or three times now, it's just like trading is like life, you know, you need discipline in what you do, you need to be take responsibility for your own actions, you need integrity, and that's what you're talking about, is, um, yeah, we, we click talking because I think you and I, there's a lot of um, question marks about some things that go on in the world of finance and in, and in the world of social media. There's a lack of integrity, a lack of account, accountability in some places. And so you seek it out. And when, you know, you strike me immediately as someone I can, uh, an honest person who's got some good ideas, some clever ideas, and we can talk and discuss them. And, you know, we, we think uh, quite similar. I think a lot of people out there think uh, the same way. Um, it's not just about intellectual pursuits. It's not just about trading in the seat of your pants or having a bit of nous. It's actually about integrity and uh, and being true, true to yourselves, but also true to the things that matter. Um, you know, where we we trade for different reasons. Uh, but I would never. The one thing I would stress is never jeopardize things that really matter to you through by taking unnecessary risks, which is probably this week's disclaimer. <laughs> Yeah, but it, oh, it's very interesting because all this goes back to trading FOMC, how to trade that responsibly. Yeah. And uh, I think it's, in a way, I think Twitter, which is such a journalist-driven venue where uh, 
that was the reason why Twitter sort of broke was journalists realized they can get really cheap stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's changed. It's quite interesting how it's Twitter's changed. Sorry, go on. No, I, yeah, just to end my, my argument, uh, uh, what's dangerous is to... I mean, I, I love Business Insider. I, I'm proud to say it. Uh, it's the, one of the few sites I actually type in the URL. And But then again, it's kind of dangerous to read too much of this because, first of all, Macroeconomic indicators are important to a degree, but I think you get so you get so deep in the forest that you can't really see see anything. It's everything is green or everything is uh, or you fall and everything is uh, is brown, and that's kind of what it's like to yeah, to well, sit and just look, 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 and it's like NFP and and all these things. It it really doesn't matter. And then when you talk to a guy like uh, Carl Richards yesterday. And he said, uh, so he can take two days and not look at markets because uh, that's not uh, that's not how uh, that's not how he operates. And I I truly respect that approach. And I I truly I mean, working as a trader is, is one of the emotionally possibly hardest jobs there is. Uh, there are. And uh, yeah, but it's like that, the stress is relative. Yeah, stress is relative. I mean, my my two year olds gets more stress than I ever do trading. You know, if I take away his, um, oh, this morning, he's eating, he's, he's somehow managed to find a packet of pancakes, you know, he's sitting on the floor, <laughs> big smile on his face, and he's eating, munching away, and I take them away, and the world ends. You know, you can't handle that. Um, you know, I can take, let's say I get it wrong today, and I take a habit, you know, take a loss, you know, I'm not going to react as badly as that. It's, it's all relative in how you, you take stress. And there's one thing you do learn, and this is another thing about experience and shortcuts, is you learn to take the losses because you know it's not a death by a thousand knives, it's it, or a thousand cuts. You've been cut so many times, you know it's part of the business. It's you're going to lose some. You know, That's once you've lost enough times, then you can uh, take kid. the losses much easier than if you're taking them for the first few times. But why, why do you think? Uh, oh, yeah, there's something interesting that's happening in Norway right now. Breaking news. So I'm going to break it. Uh, that the Norwegian firm has broken. Uh, can't translate this. Uh, they've broken the the law basically, and uh, the Norwegian authorities are at their office right now. It's kind of dodgy. Uh, it's called Funcom. They they make games anyway. I'm just I just wanted to break some news just for the hell of it. I, uh, I, I, I've been in that that position and before. People jump and say what? Um, I used to um, I used to when I started off doing I went off on my own. Uh, well, with two two partners. I used in um, attached to one of the Robert Maxwell companies. Uh, and uh, so when the you know Robert Maxwell jumped overboard, um, you know all his his companies, his trading operations, etc., closed down, and I was on my own in this massive office, um, <laughs> and I got a phone call saying, Ed, there's um, you know the serious fraud squad is coming over to to claim the offices, and you you can't you know I I can't you know I'm squeaking clean, I'm doing everything by the by, but I'm renting, I uh, wasn't renting because they gave me free space, um, I had free space, uh, you know, they're not going to believe me by saying, oh, it's, this is computer, these computers are mine, hands off, um, and so, um, you know, I quickly moved all my equipment out, and it was fine, and hunky-dory, and they never even, um, and they even spoke to anyone uh, about it, but it was an interesting experience, being, um, seeing what happened there. Yeah, uh, and talking about in questions of integrity and finance. But I, I want to talk more about why your kid is freaking out, uh, and I, I always found this to be so interesting. Exactly this, because it's you, you, uh, as a child, you have so many, like you, your world is so small, so you have this like, your house is basically your world, and maybe kindergarten and a few things, but and then you get older and you add kind of buildings, and then it's like the school. And then eventually it becomes a town, and you become a little older, maybe it becomes a country, and eventually, like you're old, and people live everywhere in the world. So when you start worrying about wars and all these things, and what's so interesting about uh, how old is he? Two. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, he was two last Sunday. So Monday. So what, Monday. Have you ever thought why he he's so worried about losing the pancakes? Like he, like, he likes food. No, but like, what's really going on? I have a theory on this. Having no children, it's easy to have a theory. Okay, yeah, far away. Uh, I think it's all about control. So uh, people want control, almost from the se at least from the second you're conscious. I think. So when you start forming memories, when you're around two years old, and 
what you're doing when you're pulling away the pancakes is the one thing he's got, you're just like taking it away and then he, he's, he can't control his circumstances. But the one thing he can control is throwing a fit and uh, maybe the clothes he wears because he can refuse to wear clothes. So I think that's part of the reason why he does that. And it's kind of like uh, um, ju just throwing a fit is the only really act actionable thing he can do. But no, but he doesn't think about throwing a fit. It's not so. No, no, no. I'm not saying he, it. he just. I'm just, just saying that like, that's your. He's just taking his food away. Yeah, but that's why yeah. grown-ups don't throw fits because we have a, like you say, we have a. Well, we do more different ways, isn't it? Yeah, but sometimes it's very rare. So, but when you take this to the trading thing, uh, the only really thing you can control is your emotions. And people spend so much time looking at macroeconomic indicators, looking at all these like uh, uh, things to try and figure out why. Uh, this or that will happen to justify the trade you you're already in maybe stuck in or whatever and maybe you're geared and maybe you could go bankrupt and you're just hoping really and i just I think, yeah yeah i think well actually the reason i was looking for a quote because you were talking along the lines again i am obviously i think having shared me the picture of paul tudor jones uh, there's a great quote from him where you this is paul tudor jones speaking where you want to be is always in control never wishing always trading and always first and foremost protecting your butt and um what you're saying is is you know is well that certainly applies to trading um whether it applies to my two-year-old he always wants to be in in control i would love to credit him with that intelligence and foresight but maybe that's to come um but uh, i think it is it's you know you talk you're going back to trading uh, the great traders the point they always make is first and foremost protect your capital protect the risk know your risk and to do that and this is you know, is part of your point is to know your risk then you have to know what affects your risk and you more than anything else affects the risk that you take or your capital so you have to know yourself and then once you've known you know got a better idea once you start looking at not just like i think the euro is going to spike higher today and i'm going to sell it is is like Let's say the euro spikes higher today on the back of FOMC. I've given out, and that's something I did a video on this earlier. And I'm going to sell it. I think it's going to 130s. It's going to go to margin new highs by 10 pips, and it's going to be quick. What am I going to do? Am I going to go, oh, is this what I thought? Let's have a look at the chart. Oh, I wonder what the RSIs are going to do. I wonder, if, where's that trend line? You know, no, because I know already. That I, that's what I'm thinking. That's where it's going to go. Well, I'm, I'm looking to, to sell more. And I'm not. I don't have the luxury on something like that. I'm just going to sell it. Now, I may put an order in. I may try and tick it. I think in this instance, it might be so quick if it does happen that I'll, I'll, I'll put the order in. But I also know that, you know, what, what am I going to think if it comes out and it's at 137.16 next, it's 138 bid. Well, how am I going to react? Well, I, I know how I'm going to react. I'm going to think, well, that was a stupid idea. I'll give, I'll give it some more time. Should I give it some more time? No, I don't trade that way. I know exactly my levels. I know where I'm going to be in and out and wrong. Because I don't want to be second guessing in an environment where the market is, by the time I actually even started spelling the word second guess, it's already moved. So I've already got my, my, my levels in. And that way I've controlled my risk because I can know if I don't control it, how I'm likely to react, and therefore I can know how I will react when I've got the uh, the control. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I totally, I totally agree. And it, it's kind of like uh, I don't know, to drive a Formula One car or something like this. Uh, if you're so consciously I would argue, thinking, then, uh, oh, I would but argue, you can't as far consciously as think. Is concerned, I shouldn't have said his name. My wife hates me when I say that. When he, my two-year-old is, um, it was funny you mentioned car. I think that's what it did it. When my two-year-old has got his pancakes. The way to avoid getting really upset about his pancakes <laughs> is not to have the pancakes in the first place. Yeah, I've made my point. I hope he was listening. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking how you can uh, use that. For the approach of trading, because it is it is such a similar, it is such a similar. Well, like, it's it's not rocket science, you know. We're talking about risk. We're talking about reaction to risk. We're talking about emotions. Uh, understanding those emotions. Understanding how you can move and change to uh, sometimes to the good, but generally to the um, to the bad, and therefore how do you remove that? 
Now, there's, it's human nature to react in a certain way. So you can say, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to. I'm not going to be upset when I'm a 1% down on a big position. You're going to be upset when you're 1% down on a big position. So how, what can I do to avoid that? If I'm willing to accept that, because I think it's necessary to make 10, then what can I do to help that? You know, you, there are all sorts of people out there that will help you um, in that process with different techniques. There's all certain ways. One, of the, I, one thing I always do, for me, I've learned the best way to be able to handle a loss or potential loss or be in a situation where I don't bail out because the pain's too great is I emotionally try and write the loss off when I take the position. I so think, I I think the, that's, spot, that's a very good, that's very good advice, actually. That's, just that's just write what, it off because that's part no, of the No, but game. that's what you, I mean, you have to, like, let's keep, like, keep that in mind, like what you just said, because I think that's probably the single most important thing you have to learn if you're going to do this for a living. Because uh, it looks so easy. And like, like we talked about with Carl yesterday, I mean, you just click a button and it's binary. You buy it or you sell it. And you have a few tens of thousands of different instruments. Maybe let's say a thousand that are really liquid. And what do you do? Do you buy or sell? And that's how they make a fortune. So... Uh, that, that sounds incredibly simple when you tell someone. It does, but that's why so many people come into this business. Exactly, but that's my point. And and, but you have to take what you just said, and you have to be able to control risk. That's such a vague term. But that's exactly what you have to do. So you have to have a system that you can test and, and adjust and test and adjust, and you have to have uh, control of your emotions. But that being able to, to take, take the loss and not think about it two seconds later i think that's the key that's how you because that's like what a footballer breaks his foot he becomes he steps a little softer on it and it takes away his spring i remember wayne rooney had that problem or uh, that's a bad analogy but a footballer breaks his foot he can't play football yeah if you take it no loss, he breaks his foot it heals he comes back but his step is slightly softer and he loses that percent he needs to outperform and that's kind of, I, I, I think it's an apt analogy because it's a performance sport and this is a Maybe performance. Maybe we should call, rename name the show The Analogy Show. No, but, but I think, I mean, this is, this is why this is so important because starting a business, which I have done now in the last year, and trading is kind of similar because you're on your own. Uh, you're doing something where people are generally telling you you shouldn't do it and uh, you just have to make do uh, with whatever you got. But I've become so interested in like these, um, uh, all these, not self-help, but like these motivational quotes, like Paul Tudor Jones or whoever. And it, it's so interesting how much I have started to focus on my own emotions and controlling my emotions. Yeah, that's uh, And it's like you have a bad day and you just, <coughs> you just have to dig deep and find positive things. And the thing about the thing about you know taking uh, quotes, I use quotes a lot, but um, uh, because they're, it's funny, I, I tell you why because they articulate a thought I have, or, or articulate it in a similar way, um, but it has more impact if it comes from. It's interesting how I look at the retweets. Um, if George, if I tweet, if I tweet um, George Soros, Warren Buffett, and um, Paul Tudor Jones, they get tweeted, retweeted a lot. Actually, I tweeted someone, I didn't know where the quote came from, and he said, um, where did that guy turn up? He actually, the guy who I quoted, suddenly so popped up and said, hi. <laughs> I said, like, okay, cool. Uh, but the thing about all these quotes, a lot of them are in danger of being cliches. And in, therefore, a lot of them are in danger of being, always appearing to be right. Um, and there are lots of cliches out there which are, are probably wrong 100% of the time. There are a lot of cliches, more importantly, that are right, right some of the time, uh, wrong at other times. Um, and that's not just to quotes, but some of the many that's a, that's cliches that applies quote, to yeah. true trading. <laughs> like, what's the one? Never let your position run into a loss. Is that a quote? Well, if that's I buy at 10 quote. and it goes to 30 and goes back 05 given... I'm on a loss. Am I going to take it out after 15 points? I've got an idea. This baby's going to run for 150. No, I'm out. Never take my position on loss. Okay, so let's say that must mean like once you've let it go 100 points, oh, well, I'm looking for 1,000. You know, you can't, I can argue, you can argue against any sensible um, sentiment or, or thought process out there because you're applying it to the wrong situation, which applies to not just to um, 
applies to lots of things in trading. So there are certain conditions that certain things will work in. Certain quotes, certain sentiments apply to certain elements. And it's, you, you know, at the end of the day, you can say it's all a crapshoot, it's all a load of rubbish, it's all just um, a random walk. But I think I personally, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced. I know it's not a random walk. There is a, There are wisdoms out there. Um, things, uh, good approaches, sensible approaches, and it's not just a question of, of luck. Um, I actually want to continue this conversation for a long time, but I don't know if you can. I just really like talking about this. It's uh, it's like thought well, it's like thought provoking. Yeah, there's a it's a massive subject. You know, um, these are all massive subjects. Mm. Um, I don't mind. You know, there's a time we can talk about some of these things later and get some feedback from people what they'd like to talk about. I kind of like. Sorry, what I like is uh, I. Yeah, you know, I, I love social media. I think it's a real democratization, making things so accessible to people. I'd like people to come in, you know, where, if we're talking or whoever you're talking to, whatever. Someone says, yeah, but what do you think of X? Not necessarily. You don't want to go in a situation, what do you think of this market for the next 30 minutes? Because all, all I'd ever be doing is looking at a chart. But what about, you know, you, someone says, well, what about in 1992? The, the consequences of that were X, Y, and Z. You can't apply it to, you know, someone's got a point. An interesting point to make then make it on Twitter because you know if I don't pick it up you don't pick it up someone else will pick it up and feed it through or someone says you know um, you talk about emotion but have you or have you seen this approach or you know there's also uh, just feedback just some ideas is, is I'm gonna kind of I'm gonna add something to the live page right now uh, so if you hashtag with big TV it will show up there so it's embedded. It's kind of like a chat room. I'm going to make a chat room as well. I, don't, I just haven't had time. <laughs> so we want to make it more interactive. We're going to have a call-in functionality and all these things uh, if we want to. So uh, just to have that ability. So let's see. I'm going to add, uh, I'm going to add the Twitter uh, widget on the bottom. So, uh, yeah, but I, I think we're probably coming to an end here for today. Uh, wow. It was quite good, wasn't it? Yeah, you see, again, it goes back to the same, the same thing. But one reason I, I like this is, is um, there's an opportunity to explore ideas. I mean, I, I, I'm sorry I kind of stamped on you. I didn't want you to go start talking about 28, 29 because... You know, it's an interesting, it's a massive subject, really interesting subject. But yeah. I think it's germane for another time rather no, than You're right, you're right. I just wanted to have it out. I, I was like burning with the... I know you were yesterday. But I, I'm just no, going to no, sign let's off Let's talk now. about it another time. Yeah, but, but I'm just um, going to sign off. And if you, so before I turn off the recording, I just want to say, please follow us on Twitter, TV But Big or something like that. You can find it. Uh, and also subscribe on YouTube. Uh, eventually sign up to the newsletter there's a link somewhere and uh, yeah we just want to be able to retain as many of you as possible because right now we're we're just like eking along and we have like say, vague uh, schedules but this is going to become a much more interactive show uh, we're gonna have a, a, a guest every day and uh, we're gonna be doing more stuff so Keep yeah, there's some really, and, really interesting ideas, exciting ideas. Yeah. Um, I, I'm really. Yeah, um, it's, it's going to be. I mean, this is the the most interesting show. This, yeah, it's probably arguably at its least interesting now. I would say, but yeah. um, that's we're waxing poetic, both of us. <laughs> anyway, well, it's a learning We're going to be back around the same time tomorrow, uh, around eleven London time, twelve Norwegian time, and all the other time zones. Okay. Uh, thanks, Ed, for... Uh, you can stick around a little bit, so the people are watching the live stream, you can continue chatting a little bit. I'm waiting for uh, for the new show now, next. Okay, well, come yeah, back tomorrow. Um, but anyone trading, going into FOMC uh, or doing anything after is good luck. Yeah, and Let's hope it's a good one.